Welcome to INET's webinar, COVID-19 and Surveillance Technology. It is a topic that I believe is on many of our minds as technology plays an ever greater role in our lives in the wake of the crisis. Our speaker today is Bruce Schneier, who may be familiar to some of you from his blog, Schneier on Security, and his newsletter, Cryptogram, both of which are very widely read, contributing to his reputation as a security guru in the words of The Economist. Bruce is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and a board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He has written over a dozen books, the most recent of which is Click Here to Kill Everybody. We're delighted that Bruce can be with us today to help us make sense of some of the issues around privacy and security, and what to some of us seems like a pretty stark trade-off between what are clear benefits from the use of technology to navigate the issues raised by the pandemic and the threat of a shift closer to a surveillance society as expectations of privacy are slowly being eroded. The trade-off is starkest perhaps when we consider the use of digital contact tracing, which has been used extensively in several countries, sometimes with fairly extreme enforcement approaches like GPS tracking bracelets that inform health workers when someone steps outside a quarantine zone and they are told to return. The apps we are discussing in the US and that are already being used in parts of Europe are of course supposed to be less invasive and opt in, but even with the supposed safeguards that will be put into place, there is some question as to whether the benefits of these apps are sufficient to outweigh the costs when we consider factors like asymptomatic transmission. Bruce will talk about this and the broader issue of surveillance and privacy for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A icon. You can type in your questions there, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time we have. So Bruce, over to you. Thank you, and thanks for uh, showing up virtually. This is our new normal, and we're making the best of it. So I want to talk about uh, privacy, security, and contact tracing, both specifically and generally. There are a lot of issues here, and it's worth teasing apart uh, what they are. I've written about contact tracing, uh, less about privacy and more about efficacy. Because the first question in any of these uh, electronic systems is, is it any good? Is it effective? Is it going to do anything positive? And I, uh, I maintain that uh, contact tracing apps are effectively useless. And the fact that we're considering them is really just tech solutionism and doesn't reflect any actual defense against the pandemic. And I want to walk you through the reasoning. The, the contact tracing apps are very much like an authentication system. Uh, you know, and they're trying to figure out whether something is true or not. When you get any of these systems, you look at accuracy in two ways in terms of false positives or in terms of false negatives. So if you imagine an, an ATM machine, you have an ATM card. And the security, you look at it in both of those uh, perspectives. A false positive, can someone else get money out of my account? And that would be the ATM machine mistaking someone else for me. If it can do that, it fails as a system. But there's another failure mode that's actually even more important, and that's a false negative. When I go up to my ATM machine, will I be denied my money? And that actually will happen more often just because the number of legitimate requests vastly outnumber the number of fraudulent requests. And in any of these systems, an ATM machine, uh, you know, the, the fingerprint ID on my iPhone, false positives and false negatives. Can someone else open their iPhone? with their finger pretending to be me? And is there a point where I can't open my iPhone because it, the phone doesn't recognize that I am me? So with that model, let's talk about, about contact tracing. So the app basically, you know, it knows where you are, it knows who's near you, and it registers contacts. I'm gonna make this up. A contact is more than 10 minutes, less than six feet. And that's what the system will register. And we can build in different privacy safeguards. We can build in where that data goes, who gets to see it. No, but put all that aside, it's registering what it defines as a contact. So let's think about the false positives. And, and, and that's things that, that, don't, that aren't causes of concern. So there are inaccuracies in the, uh, 
in the in the well in, in both the geographical location of the phone and the proximity sensor. So this using multiple systems, actually three systems to, to do that on your phone. There is the, the cell system, very coarse, tells you what cell you're in. And that has to work, otherwise this phone can't ring. It doesn't know I'm here. There's a more accurate GPS system, which you've used if you've used any kind of navigation system. And you know it's pretty accurate, but makes mistakes. I play Pokemon Go on this phone. I know how GPS drift works, and I see it all the time. And then lastly, there's Bluetooth. And that's the system you use to communicate uh, with other objects close by. It doesn't know your location, but kind of signal strength is a proxy for proximity. And, and that's what it's using. So those all have error rates. There are a lot of times this will register that you are close to somebody when you're actually not. Uh, the second is that the phones don't know about extenuating circumstances. I mean, there are times when I am less than two feet from somebody else for a period of eight hours and we're separated by a hotel room wall or a glass partition. I could be in a car and someone can be outside. Lots of times right, when that we are in close proximity, but it doesn't matter for disease transmission. And the third uh, source of false positives is that there are contacts that don't result in transmission. It is not the case that less than six feet, more than 10 minutes equals a disease transmission. It equals a possibility. Right? Lots of times when, I mean, we're actually much more sophisticated about how the disease transfers now than we were even a few months ago. We know that airflow matters. We know that ambient amount of particles uh, in the room matter. Inside versus outside matters. Whether you're speaking or singing matters. Whether you're wearing a mask matters. None of that taken into account. Right? So this thing, registers, registers contact, doesn't mean I have the disease. Let's look at the false negatives. Right? And that's me getting the disease without this registered contact. So we have the same inaccuracy problem. This doesn't always know where I am and who I'm near. Uh, not everyone has the app. But even Singapore had a 20% accept rate for the app. You need 80 or 90 to make this a useful system. With lots of people you're going to be near don't have the app. And then there's the transmissions without a contact. I mean, by now, I think we've all watched the animated videos of a sneeze and how far the particles travel. It's way more than six feet. And so there'll, there'll be lots of times you will get the disease without this phone realizing there's a contact. So given all that error rate, here's the question. I have the app, I go out grocery shopping, I come back and this thing beeps. Does that mean I have the disease? No. Does it mean I should quarantine? Probably not. Does it mean anything useful? Not really. Similarly, I go out, this thing doesn't beep. Does that mean I'm safe? Kind of doesn't. And the most important thing we have in this pandemic is trust. And squandering that trust in an app that doesn't work. You know, after three days, there'll be Twitter posts. This thing didn't work. It didn't tell me I, got, uh, I had the disease. It, it, it told me I was sick and I wasn't. It, it didn't register that I was sick. Right? So there's not value in that. There's value in contact tracing. The, where it's done effectively is South Korea. Uh, the Boston area, it's manual. It involves trust, it involves interviews, it involves people. It does not involve an app. And there's a lot of tech solutionism here. All right, so let's sort of put that aside and think about where we might want to use technology. So there are three things I'll hear about when I hear about tech and, and, and COVID. Uh, the first is, is contact tracing. The second is some of these aggregate statistics which seem to be very valuable. There's a, uh, a company that makes internet connected th uh, thermometers, fever thermometers, and they've been posting hotspots of fever around the country based on their aggregate data. Really interesting. You know, we see charts on how people are, are staying indoors by how they're using Apple Maps to get to driving directions, and walking directions. You know, we, we can know a lot about general movements. 
right? very anonymous, very valuable. The third thing you, see, you hear talked about are, you hear them under a lot of names, I think there's immunity passports. And is there some sort of digital document I will need to be able to get into a movie theater, a restaurant, a dance club that proves that I have immunity? I haven't seen those, those are talked about. In a sense, they're no different than uh, credentials we have today. I mean, right now I have a driver's license, which is my age verification card, which I need to prove to get into a, uh, to a bar. So it's those similar things. I don't think the, uh, the, the, uh, the mechanism will be any different. When you think about any of these things, there are a bunch of general privacy uh, principles that, that we have, that we apply. I mean, is it effective? And more importantly, is it proportional? You know, we're in a global health crisis. It makes sense to make extreme trade-offs. The things we wouldn't do in normal time, we might do today. If contact tracing via app was a, an effective thing, we would all probably say, yeah, that's a good idea. Now, today. Not last year, maybe not next year, but now. Right? So is it effective? Is it, is it proportional? And then we want to see uh, six different things. We want to see consent. Does the user consent to it? We want to see minimization. Is the data minimized to the extent necessary? Is it secure? Is the data secure? Is the system transparent? Do we know what it's doing and how it's working? Is it unbiased? Does it disadvantage some group in one way or the other? And then lastly, is it temporary? Is it something we can turn off when the crisis is over? And those six things are how we should evaluate, I guess seven, if you count efficacy and proportionality, are how we should evaluate any of these systems. And it's really not just true here in COVID, it's true everywhere. And a lot of people are writing about how contact tracing can undermine privacy by putting us all under surveillance. We're all already under surveillance. And this device knows where everyone is knows when you wake up and knows when you go to sleep because it's the first and last thing you do. You all have one and knows who you sleep with. And Google, your search, knows your innermost hopes, fears, dreams, because you search on them. And Google already knows what kind of porn everyone, every, everyone likes. And these, these aren't differences. It's just a new usage. But surveillance is the business model of the internet. There's no change here. Adding a, one app to the 50, on your phone that track you is kind of so what? But I want to close with uh, kind of an interesting, I think, interplay, which we're seeing here as increasingly important. So data has value to us as a society and us individually. Contact tracing, let's assume it's effective, as you make this choice, your data together will help us fight the disease. Your location data, who you talk to, who you're with, yet that is incredibly private and personal. Like that is a balance. And, you, and there's that similar balance appears in a lot of other places. You know, when I used to drive places, I used Google Maps that got me, uh, route, it would route me around traffic. That worked because everyone who uses Google Maps is under surveillance. And that's how the system knows where the traffic is. The group value is we all get where we want to go faster. The individual risk is our location information. Now you think of Facebook. Facebook will give you free access to talk to your friends and have your communities, do all that cool stuff, yet they want to know everything about you to target advertising. That's the trade-off. More generally in health, I think there's enormous value in taking all of our medical data putting it in one database and letting researchers add it. I think the benefits would be enormous. Yet at the same time, that's incredibly personal, intimate health data. In all of these cases, it's the same question. How do I balance this value to me as a member of the group to the value to me individually? And there's no one answer to this. It's very domain specific. 
right? So Google Maps, I can make this up. Uh, the data is valuable for only 10 minutes. You don't save it. You don't need to know who it is, so it's all anonymous. And you don't need all the data, so you sample one in 10 cars. Like, done. I've kind of just solved that. Medical data, that's not going to work. I need everybody's data by name forever in a database with everything. So I can't do any of those solutions. So maybe do something else. I, I secure it uh, very, very strongly. I only allow queries that have been pre-approved under strict uh, guidelines and contractual obligations where research questions are approved in advance and only uh, aggregate data is provided in return unless there is some rules about unmasking. I and mean, I'm kind of just making this up, but it'll be a wholly different set of trade-offs. And it'll be yet a third set for contact tracing and maybe a fourth set for free internet services in exchange for advertising and a fifth set when we talk about uh, data that the police might want to stop crimes and terrorism. But this to me is a fundamental question about data in this century that we haven't explicitly answered. You know, mostly we allow for-profit corporations to do what they want to sort of figure out the trade-off that works for their near-term profitability and kind of accept it. But I'd like us to think about it more deliberately and make uh, decisions about it more deliberately. And that's what COVID, among other things, is bubbling up. So we'll see how that goes. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, that was a really good um, overview of some of the issues. And I'd love to be able to uh, delve a little deeper in some of them. The point that I hear coming from you loud and clear is that we actually need a bigger, more federal approach, let's say, to thinking about how we feel about data privacy. And the problem is that this hasn't been handled at the level that it needs to be handled. Um, given that we are where we are, we are looking, as you point out, at very specific trade-offs in each of these places. So um, I want to drill down a little bit deeper into the six issues that you mentioned, um, starting with this idea that, um, which was the last actually on your list about efficacy, which was, you know, the first thing you started with, it doesn't seem like this would be very effective. Um, there are studies that have come out. The Oxford Univers University Big Data Institute found that a coronavirus outbreak in a city of 1 million people is halted if 80% of all smartphone users use a tracking system. Um, and, you know, caveats in this model, they assume that the elderly are expected to self-isolate en masse. Um, but, you know, since what we really need is to get the RO below one, we really just need to shift things a little bit. And no one, I think, is talking about digital tracing, contact tracing in and of itself. We're all talking about using it in conjunction with a manual system. So this army of digital contact tracers that Cuomo talks about, we're still going to need that. The question is, is it helpful to have this as an added little thing to add that little extra um, bonus, which potentially pushes the number down, the RO number down far enough that we can actually get this thing moving in the right direction. And the issue that I think we're going to run into, you know, obviously there's this idea of 80% of people choosing to download the app. And you say, even in Singapore, it's only 20%. If we can actually address some of the privacy and security issues, which I would like to go into a little bit further, isn't that the key to getting people to adopt this? You say trust is the most important piece. Isn't that the key to be able to build trust so that we can actually get people to comply with a system that allows us to move this in the right direction? Well, I, think, I think the key is uh, the thing that we need, otherwise this is, this is a waste of time, which is ubiquitous, fast, cheap, accurate testing. Without that, none of this matters. Right? With that, a lot of things are good enough. So sure, it, this, a digital app, if you convey its limitations, its problems, if you don't treat it as this is the magic thing that will keep you safe, could easily be part of a more extensive manual human-based system because it will be more trusted. 
But the key is testing. I mean, the thing that, that we need to make this, this, this work is testing. And you know, I'm actually not worried about the privacy of these apps. The, the, the uh, Apple Google system is fine. It, it's got a lot of privacy protections. And actually what it does is it pushes all of the decisions about who gets the data, how it's dealt with, when it's made uh, not public, when, when, it, when it bubbles up, to, the, uh, to, the, to whoever puts the system together, they just building an API. They actually punted on all of the hard questions because they didn't want to be responsible for it. So, you know, different countries will have different rules about centralization and decentralization and, uh, you know, how it could be made voluntary or mandatory or how to make it work. I mean, that's stuff we can do. That's just the tech. The tech is actually not the hard part here. Well, the hard part of the tech is the testing part. But it really is getting societies to, to take this seriously and work together. So sure, an app can be a part of this solution. You just, you just understand what it can and can't do, and not expect more of it. And Singapore has dumped their app because, I mean, it was really just politi giving politicians something to talk about. It wasn't actually doing any, anything valuable. I think by the time we get this system like in place and scaled, this is like a year or two year project. This is not something that's done in a week. So it, it'll, it'll be too late. I, you're not gonna really see this. You're not gonna see this actually mattering. I mean, but if we had testing, if, if I, I'm trying to, we're trying to teach at Harvard in September and try to figure out if the school can open up. And basically dorm, dorms are the same thing as cruise ships. So it really seems hard. But if you can test the entire student body once a week, then maybe you can do it. And if you can't, there's probably no way you can. And an app isn't going to fix any of that. So then manual digital tracing also is not likely to be helpful. I think given it's, helpful, it's more helpful, but manual it involves interviews. And there's some really, really interesting uh, studies. I've, I've seen reports where they're, they're looking at transmission. This is how we know a lot more about transmission, where a restaurant, I think it was in Hong Kong, was mapped, who was sitting where, where the infected person was, who got the disease. That's how we kind of know that the flow of the air conditioning mattered a lot. There was a call center where one person was sick and, and people didn't, didn't, depending on where they were in the room. Uh, there was a church, which was a choir. We, we know a lot more. And, and those are all through contact tracing. But that was, apps don't give you that level of detail, that fine-grained knowledge. But the you know, app at scale is basically something to tell you as an individual, you are now at risk. That's what the app does. And the app can't do that, unfortunately. Yeah. Because the error rates are too high in both directions. And you, in order for, and this is hard, we, have, we always run into this when we want to tell the general public to do something. It has to be actionable, immediate, and useful. Like, wash your hands. I can tell you to do that. That works. Wear a mask. I can tell you to do that. Right? If the app beeps quarantine for two weeks, not a chance. Unless that thing is dead on accurate. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So going back to the six things that you mentioned, one of the things you brought up was the issue of bias. Uh, there's obviously a huge issue with respect to inequality in terms of who's actually being affected by um, the disease. And there's an increasing discussion as to how any kind of digital approach to dealing with this is just gonna exacerbate it. Because if you look at the fact that, I don't know if it's true, but rumors are that um, Android-based systems aren't as effective with this and you know they're I that, that, that but you're right that is definitely a a cultural divide i mean Can iPhone, you talk a little bit about that tend to be the wealthier have the iphone uh-huh and so if it's going to exacerbate the issues that we're already seeing with inequality yeah. around this there's a lot of inequalities around this disease because the comorbidity conditions are, are so important right so if you've had bad health care all your life you're more likely to get more sick and die if you uh, have had bad, you know, bad nutrition, if you uh, uh, are obese, uh, you are diabetic, you have a heart condition, this is more likely to, to affect you. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing that both in the United States along racial divides, uh, national 
divides. I mean, Germany is surviving this like surprisingly well, and probably in five years we're going to understand what is it about the German lifestyle, you know, stereotypically that makes them more likely to survive. Oddly, smokers are more likely to survive. You know, we don't know why yet. So, but so yes, I think that there are, we have to worry a lot about how this affects uh, different groups in different ways. Not just the app, but in general. I mean, it's really exposing the inequities in the American healthcare system. Right. Um, given that you're pointing to the fact that we have not answered these questions more broadly in terms of controlling privacy, and what we've heard so far, you say that it's not a problem in terms of the technology with respect to Google and Apple, and we can tell them to delete the data anytime we want. But as a political economy question, we all understand that the way that this has worked is that it's being, much of the privacy question is being driven by the ad revenue question and the fact that we have these tech monopolies. So from a political economy perspective, how do we think about the issues of, you know, we're handing over the potential to do this to Google and Apple. We're handing over the ability to collect yet more personal data to these companies. How do we think about actually putting into place some kind of regulations that say the data is going to be deleted at such and such time, there are only these restrictions, and maybe not even Google and Apple, how do we control the fact that this data could then go over to governments and we've just sort of handed over yet more of our private data to them? So I don't know the, I don't know the yet more. I mean, this has been happening for the past 10 years. Nothing is new. This mm -hmm. data has been collected. This data is being used against you. This data is being handed over to government well before COVID. I don't see any change. And yes, this is a huge issue. And so Shoshana Zuboff has a book this thick called The Rise of Surveillance Capitalism. It was published well before COVID. Yeah. Again, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it's already a 9.5, and maybe now it's 9.5001. I mean, so what? But yes, I mean, right now, we're living in a world where these systems are designed for the near-term financial benefit of large multinational corporations. That's the way the system works. And I don't like it. I think we shouldn't like it. And we should try to fix it. How is gonna be hard? You know, in the United States, there's no appetite for any real regulation that would offend the wealthy. Instead of in any way, shape or form, it's not gonna happen here. And I'm, I'm looking more towards Europe right now. They, they seem to be the regulatory superpower on the planet and are doing something a little bit to try to increase privacy, not very much. But these are important questions to have. I mean, is, are these business models moral? I mean, do we want surveillance capitalism to be the driving form of capitalism in the century? Do we want to give up all of our data to be used really against our interests, right? It's you being used to manipulate us. That's advertising, that's, you know, or at, you know, for corporate needs and increasingly for political needs. But I, you know, I don't see the, the contact tracing apps as adding to that. So, I mean, the, the protocol is, I don't know if people have an iPhone. Uh, iPhone has sort of a find my phone feature. Where if you've lost your phone, you can uh, do something and uh, other phones sort of in the nearby will look for it for you. That was an extraordinarily well-designed system that protects privacy at all levels. There isn't this big database of phones and where they are. Period. I mean, we can do the math. I see. We can build the privacy tech. And, and yes, there'd be one private app among the 50 apps that are tracking your location that are not private. So, you know, so what? Already in the US, we have governments querying these databases for law enforcement, for counterterrorism, for, for lots of applications. Already, China is using location data on your phone in Hong Kong to track protesters. Right. Nothing to do with COVID. Yeah. COVID doesn't make that worse. COVID doesn't make that more likely. It's already happening and it's already a big deal. And COVID just means people are thinking about it more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me turn to the questions that we have coming in. So. Um, if you're just joining us, you weren't there at the beginning, there is a panel at the bottom that says Q&A. So uh, feel free to type in any questions that you might have for Bruce. 
Um, and we have a question here that's asking about the state of the specific apps. Um, and while you say they might not be very helpful, there is a question as to where we are with the Google and Apple app. And then something about the Bloomberg contract tracing initiative in New York. Tim Copsiel is asking, is the Bloomberg contract tracing initiative in New York app based? Any thoughts on what's being done there? I don't know about uh, what's being done in New York, so I, so I can't comment on that. As to where the, uh, the Apple Google system is, it's sort of interesting. They're building an API. They're not building an app. They're not building a system. They are building a set of tools, software tools, that you as a country, as a state, as a city, can use to build a system. And from what I know, lots of groups are looking at it, and nothing has been fielded yet. So there was this Singapore system, which has been abandoned. There was this Israel system. I can't tell how much it's being used, if it's being used. Uh, I know uh, stuff was happening in China. Germany is thinking about something. Lots of people are piloting and thinking. But I don't know how much of it is being done on a broad scale and, and, and trying to be effective. And you know, there's something I, I, I thought, I, I, hang on, I, I lost the point, and I, I want to see if I can, I can get it back. It'll, it'll come to me later. So keep, keep going. I'll, I'll write it down if I hear it. Okay. Um, yeah, it does seem like there actually are a number of countries that are experimenting with this. And I think many of them are using Singapore's original app and they're building variations on this. Right. So I think a number of European countries, for example. Um, but I guess my question is, are they then finding that they're really ineffective? Do we know anything about what's coming from those digital apps from countries that have already implemented it? I don't think we do. I, mean, I haven't seen a lot of info on, on the efficacy. We just know Singapore just kind of dumped theirs. That's what I think. It's another, another area that where apps are being used, and that's to monitor compliance. Yeah. Right? So you land in uh, uh, New Zealand. You land on Hawaii. Uh, you go into Israel, uh, other places. So Australia has some of this. You, you are supposed to quarantine. You are supposed to self-quarantine. And one of the ways that that can be monitored is through an app. I mean, it's kind of sloppy because you could like leave your phone at home. So it only catches the stupid, but a lot of people are stupid. Yeah. So that is another area. And, and that would be effective. We have to talk about the, uh, you know, the civil liberties uh, of that kind of, it effectively, it's kind of a sloppy uh, house arrest ankle bracelet that you're expected to hold rather than it being attached to you. That's the same kind of idea. You know, so we can do the tech. The issues tend to be the policy above it. I mean, immunity passports, I can do. Right? I can build you a, uh, some kind of digital credential that's tied to you. You can't give to somebody else because it has your picture on it or something. You can show and say, look, you know, I mean, basically a digital driver's license almost. But we have to decide, do we want a society with that kind of two-tier have and have not? You know, the safe and the unclean. It does sound kind of icky. But you could imagine us saying, you know, yes, we want to be able to reopen these businesses, but the only way we can do it, the only way we can have a concert hall in 2021 is with, a, with an immunity passport. There's just no way to do that safely. And then we decide, do we want to make this ex very extreme privacy and liberty trade-off. Yes. I don't know what the answer is, but that's not something I want to do lightly. I want to really have a, a, a national conversation about that before I just say, sure, that's a great idea. Well, that's exactly it. How do we get to the point where we can have a national conversation about this? Because you know, now that it's our health at stake, people are much more likely to be willing to give up some amount of privacy, but then the question is, is there any way to dial this back once we've got it? The question I would go back to you is say, how do we have a national conversation about pretty much anything? Right? Okay. So, right, the problem is bigger than this. And I have, I mean, I, I have stacked up some pretty serious issues in society in you know, the United States and other countries that we really need intelligent, thoughtful, kind national dialogue that I'm not getting. I mean, I can't even, about wearing a mask without it becoming a political statement, which is crazy. 
Right. I mean, clearly it's, it's out of control, but there is this issue of, you know, since we're talking about the tech in particular, we really do need a policy at a federal level that thinks about our privacy and how do we roll this back? Because I think, you know, when you talk about the issue of trust, so much of the trust issue is dependent on how much do we believe that at the end of the day, we're going to be able to get back to someplace before this, or are we just letting them erode our privacies on a day-by-day -day basis? We're letting them erode. I mean, many countries have privacy commissioners, the United States does not. That, but, you know, the big tech does not want this. The big tech basically wants all of our data all the time, and because it's an incredible wealth generation machine. Yeah. And we have a lot of trouble as a country enacting policies that go against incredible wealth generating machines. Right. My belief is that you fast forward 20 years and we will look at surveillance capitalism the way we look today as a business model of sending six year olds up chimneys to clean them. That sure it was a great business, but it was fundamentally immoral and we stopped doing it. Right. But it's going to take a lot to get from here to there. Yeah. Not something's going to happen in the next couple of years. I really believe it's going to be the younger generation when they start coming into power, coming into politics, that will be able to make these hard trade-offs that we as a generation aren't capable of. But that's true for a lot of people hunting. You know, climate change. I, I live in Minneapolis. And right now, there are protests and riots in my city because four policemen basically executed a black man who we're pretty sure didn't actually do anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, so these, the problems sort of we have that require I mean, the dialogue about the militarization of police, that's an important one. That's more important than this one. And I can't have that dialogue. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, this is my issue. I'm, I'm very sympathetic. I want this to work. But a lot of me is kind of like get in line. Yeah. Well, my fear about looking to the younger generation for this particular issue is that I feel like with the younger generation, they've already in some sense accepted the trade-off and been willing to give up so much of their privacy to live their lives online that they're less likely to be upset about it than those of us who still have some expectation of privacy. So that's a common myth. It is a myth. The whole young people don't care about privacy. Okay. Everything we know about young people from few research studies to deep dive sociological studies say that is not true. Oh, okay. Uh, young people, they think about privacy differently. You know, that for us, it's private by default and being public takes uh, effort. For them, it's public by default, being private takes effort. Got it. And they are much more sophisticated and nuanced about their privacy. They understand it to a granular degree that we tend not to. We think Facebook, everybody knows, the younger generation is much more sophisticated. And, and to them, privacy often matters, their peers, their parents, their teachers. But they are, and, and often like many of us, they feel powerless. And this is where the, uh, the sort of, uh, where the nature of these social networks matters. What's important to us as human beings is communication. And we are having this seminar on Zoom because we want to communicate with each other. Zoom had a lot of privacy issues, a lot of security issues. They've gotten better. But really, I use it all throughout. It was way more important was setting up a Zoom call with friends and having virtual dinner together. That's what mattered. And we are all such social creatures. And these platforms play on that and prey on that to take advantage of us. So it's not that young people don't care about their privacy. They care. They do what they can and they understand how powerless they are. Yeah, fair point. Uh, I have a question here from Nilo Oliveiro saying, instead of privacy, transparency must be the goal to all, including disclosure of companies' actions and capital movement. Why do we need privacy? Let's get aware of everything as long as it's shared broadly. So we'll assume the person who asked that question uh, is wearing clothes. <laughs> we'll assume he, in the questionnaire, didn't type his sexual fantasies in. And we'll assume actually he does want some privacy too. So we'll, we'll sort of get rid of that do away with privacy nonsense because no one actually believes it, right? Even, uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name, uh, who so was the uh, CEO of uh, Google who said, you have zero, Eric Schmidt, you have zero privacy already, get over it. I mean, he still keeps a lot of things private. Uh, so privacy matters for power. 
So here, I'm going to sort of give the real explanation of that. So the notion is transparency lets all know everything. So we have sort of, sort of two sort of, I guess, equilibrium states. Everything is private and everything is public. And so let's pick one and not the other. Let's pick transparency instead of privacy. The difference is the power level. So data about privacy increases your power. So think of government or corporations. So use government is up here and individuals are down here. So privacy in individuals increases their power. So there's less differential. So there's more liberty because privacy and government is closer. Transparency in individuals lowers individual power. There's a greater difference. So liberty is decreased. Okay, but watch when this happens the other way. Corporations, secrecy or privacy in corporations increases their power. Again, the differential is increased, less liberty. Transparency in corporations or governments decreases that power, there's more liberty. So you tend to want transparency for the powerful, governments and corporations, privacy for the individual. But that is what is best for liberty. Makes sense. Uh, I have a question here from Doug Carmichael. How close are we to big tech and government merging into a single big database of uh, database system of complete monopoly? Uh, I don't know, five years ago. I mean, you don't remember, you don't need a single database. You just query each other. I mean, we learned from the Snowden documents, the NSA was breaking into corporate databases all the freaking time and getting data. And we know that they were using national security letters to get databases, right? They got the entire uh, Verizon list of who made cell phone calls to whom. So you're already seeing this public-private surveillance partnership. You're never going to see one database that doesn't make any sense, right? You're going to see lots and lots of different databases and them all using each other. So already we have this like the public-private surveillance partnership. You already have the merging of government and corporate interests. In the United States under our rules, in China under their rules, in Europe, in Russia, and all, you know, in all those other countries. So this is not something that is coming to something that is here. It just doesn't look the way that you see it depicted in science fiction. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a question of how much we as a populace have to say in this question? Because if I think about India, I actually have a question here from Ishita Mukhopadhyay from India, uh, who says we have Arogya Setu app in India. Um, the app generates data and the data is shared by private health providers who use this as a market survey without the knowledge of the consumers. And you know, my understanding of this particular setup in India was that um, it had 50 million users within the first 13 days of its release. So there was a huge adoption in India. And India is already seeing a problem with the ID system that they've been using before this, which was supposed to help everyone access social um, services. And there've been tremendous uh, privacy and civic violations as a result of that. So I think you know, we're seeing countries like that where technology is being used really in its most extreme dystopian form. Yeah, I mean, Andahar was, I think was a problem from the beginning. You know, the, the promise makes sense and the government was sold on the promise. That we sort of need to know what our population is and, and how to get them benefits and how to understand them. But actually rolling that out among, you know, in a country as large and diverse as India had huge problems. And I think we're seeing the, the fraying and in any of those systems, it's always the edge cases that are that cause the problems, but they're the, they're the things that matter. So, so yes, there's there's you know India has Andahar and the United States. We really have driver's licenses, and uh, they are linked. So again, it's not one big database. It is 50, 52 individual databases that uh, can be queried together and can be uh, can be brought together. Uh, China is building their own. Sort of national system here called the social credit score, which is trying to bring a bunch of uh, disparate data streams into one large decision-making process. I think of this in, in, in three in three different ways, in three different steps. The United States is a lot of conversation now about face recognition, that there are cameras that will automatically recognize faces. They do that through uh, databases of tagged photos. 
So we have provided Facebook with an enormous resource to violate our privacy by tagging all of the photos we give to them. Yeah. Right? So, and these systems can be used to put a camera on a street, watch who walks by and attach names to them. And uh, there's talk in the United States about banning it. It's, uh, it's Cambridge has banned it. Uh, I think Oakland and California has banned this use for law enforcement. But it really is the, a much more general problem, and that's identification. And it could be your face, and it could be the MAC address of your phone. It could be uh, the way you walk. It could be your voice. It could be uh, a retina scan that is grabbed uh, with, a, with a very uh, high-resolution camera. In lots of ways you could be identified without your knowledge or consent. So identification in any way, then this correlation, taking that at any data and running it through databases and learning more stuff about you. And whether that is your arrest record, that is your credit card purchasing history, that is your Google Maps information of where you go or a combination thereof, maybe information about your finances. And finally, there's discrimination by which I mean a decision is made about you and you are now treated differently. And so you, here's a use case, you walk into a department store, I guess when you can walk into department stores once again, uh, the system knows who you are somehow, it grabs information about your buying habits and your income level, and it either treats you well or poorly, right? You know, it, the information is given to floor salespeople who treat you well or poorly based on that. That is a use case. Do we think that's fair? Do we think that's just? How different is it from right now when I, when I go to the airport, back when I went to the airport, I, mean, I used to fly 280,000 280, miles a year. I had the top tier secret status on Delta. I assure you my flying experiences was different than everybody else in that airport. Do we think that is fair and just? Do we want, you know, this happens at Disney, at Disney World. You can buy a more expensive pass that allows you to cut the line. Is that fair and just? Identification, correlation, discrimination. Say the technologies matter, but it's that flow that really matters. And again, we as a society need to decide what we want. Because corporations uh, want to discriminate and they want to devote their resources to the more profitable customer. Right. And that's going to fall along income lines, obviously, but gender lines, racial lines, I mean, pretty much every demographic line, there will be uh, a difference. And some of those are probably illegal. Yeah. The more dystopian vision that I heard of this is once they have facial recognition down to this extent and they have access to all your contacts, they can essentially take faces that are familiar to you, merge them together so that you don't actually recognize it, but the composite is likely to tap into your psychological um, perceptions and you tend to react more positively to people who are familiar. So they have a way to sell you advertising with faces that are composite that have the ability to actually get you to feel positively disposed to. As far as I know, there's only a research study. Uh, yes, the results are real. That, you know, if I can take a composite image of people you know, people like you, or, or even you and someone who looks sort of like you, you mm -hmm. won't recognize the person. You will feel, feel more, more positive towards them when you see them, either in a, a print, either in a static ad or a, uh, a video ad, you'll be more likely to buy the thing. Now that is within the realm of technology. I mean, I can deliver web pages that do that individually. I don't know if it has been done. I believe it is legal to do. But yes, I mean that is, I mean that is a, a, a deep psychological manipulation based on, you know, these this this identification, correlation, discrimination. Right. So apropos of that, there's a question here that I think really gets to the heart of the issue. It's easy to feel powerless in how my data is already used. As we move into the next phase of data being collected, what can a person outside of tech, government, and law do to ensure that our privacy is considered when new policies are being put into place? Make this a political issue. Say more, please. Unfortunately, the era of 
the era of tech things you can do is almost over. And your data is not in your hands. Your email is stored by Google or Apple or somebody else. Your photos are stored by Flickr or Fotkey or SmugMug or somebody else. Now your, your conversations are on Facebook and, and WhatsApp and YouTube. And, you know, so a lot of our data isn't under, in our hands anymore. Financial information, credit card companies have. There's not much we can do individually because we don't control our data anymore. They're in the cloud, controlled by corporations. What we can do is agitate for better policy. The thing that it hurts us the most is that this has never been a political issue, except a little bit around the edges. When this becomes a major political issue, when people campaign on this issue, then we'll get some change. Until then, we're not likely to get much. But you know, there are exceptions. California passed a data privacy law. It's not great, but it's something. You know, and there was political pressure. Yeah. So make political noise. That is the most important thing we, we can do. It's not, a, it's not a tech trick. I mean, there are tech tricks, but they're all around the edges. Yeah. I, mean, I can give you advice like don't have a credit card, don't have an email address. That's stupid advice for living in the first half of the 21st century. You need those tools. This gets back to the powerlessness point I made earlier. Not that people think that Facebook isn't spying on them. They know that Facebook is spying on them. But that's how they talk to their friends. That's how they see their relatives. That's how, they, that's how they're human. So they're, they're, they, they understand they are powerless. And they're accepting it because they have no choice. Wow. Well, Bruce, thank you for taking the time to share your ideas with this on, a, uh, on this issue with us. And what's disturbing is that once again, I feel like what we're seeing is that the issues around COVID are simply highlighting um, the issues that we've been dealing with for a long time around privacy and the political economy issues that we're dealing with big tech and monopoly. And, um, you know, there is going to be this question, I think, that as we look at contact tracing, because I do think we're very likely to have these digital apps put into place and you know they're already being used in many countries now and we're very likely to see something being used in this country so i think we're not going to be able to stop it and you know maybe it's a tiny little bit of privacy over lost over and above what we've already lost but i do think it's this constant erosion that everything about the pandemic seems to be pushing us towards. And the fact that most of us are now having our meetings over Zoom or having conversations over Zoom means there's just that much more of our personal private lives that are now accessible to these companies. So we're left once again with the big political economy questions. Um, we don't know how to, how to handle except, you know, try and address through a political context. I think it's exacerbating a lot of things. It's exacerbating the problems with our healthcare system, especially the problems with income inequality, with our, uh, our policies that favor big corporations over small businesses, with our, our, our centralized food production, with the idea that, uh, that the market will uh, extract all inefficiencies out of a system in terms of profit. And it turns out, it, it turns out inefficiencies were a security mechanism that we've lost. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of things this crisis is really exacerbating and highlighting. And, and this is a singular moment. I, mean, I think this is something uh, the likes of which we have we've seen three times in our country and previously. The American Revolution, American Civil War, and the Great Depression, World War II. That there will be enormous potential for social change. And I think we need to seize it. Very important words, I think, for all of us. Um, we have a lot of young people who tune in to INET events, and I think this is really something that they need to be taking and running with. I think this really is a call to action to all of us. So once again, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us and for taking the time. And thank you to all of you who tuned in. Um, we have this more or less running as a regular webinar series um, now. So our next webinar is going to be um, on June 11th. We're going to have Danny Roderick talking to us about issues around globalization um, in the age of COVID, uh, which of course is another critical issue because we're seeing the rise of ethno-nationalism and isolation uh, in part, I think, which is once again an exacerbation of issues that we were dealing with previously, where there was a backlash against globalization and 
the uh, pandemic has just highlighted many of the issues underneath that. So I hope you will join us for that. And uh, you can register for that if you go to the INET website. So thank you all and thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Bye-bye.